Right. We're in the book of 2 Samuel. Now, tonight I'm going to do, Lord willing, two chapters. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 20 and 2 Samuel chapter number 21. We are nearing the end of, of this study. Uh, I, I didn't count how many more Wednesday nights, but we are nearing the end. And we're also now in the last few years of David's life. So uh, we've been in this uh, uh, for a year and uh, maybe another month, maybe two at the most, we'll be done with this study. Now, I, I want to simply make some observations uh, out of 2 Samuel chapter number 20 because technically speaking, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 20 is not about David. Now, David is in the picture. Uh, David orders the attack on the insurrectionist, but beyond that, 2 Samuel chapter 20 is not about uh, David. It is about his three generals. There is an important principle in this chapter, and that is we see the governmental dealings of God with individuals and with nations. That's the lesson of chapter number 20. And so I, I, I am not going to read it. Uh, the first verse says that there happened to be there a man of, Be a, a man of Belial, a Satan worshiper. Uh, technically, in the Hebrew, the, the word Belial means, O oh, worthless one. That's what it means. But it also means uh, a devil worshiper. And there happened to be there a man of Belial whose name was Sheba. The son of Bichri, a Benjamite. By the way, that was the tribe of Saul. And this guy has been mad for all these years that David's been on the throne. And uh, he finally decides it's time for him to do something. Uh, uh, as, we, as we'll see in tonight's study, David's up in his latter years and they tries to go out to war and is too faint and too weak and they and they say, no more, go home and stay there, we'll take care of this. Uh, but uh, the occasion that gives rise to chapter 20 is this Benjamite uh, of the tribe of Saul who does not like David and has been waiting for his time uh, to rebel. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me just read Verse 1 and 2, because there's something there I need to explain. And there happened to be there a man of Belial, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjamite. And he blew a trumpet and said, We have no part in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse, every man to his tents, O Israel. So every man of Israel went up from after David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah clave unto their king from Jordan, even to Beersheba. Now, it's going to be another 50, give or take, years before the kingdom splits. Uh, the ten tribes of Israel become the northern kingdom, a separate country. Uh, this is the beginning, actually, this circumstance is the beginning of the split. And, of course, Judah is the southern tribe and these from about 50 years from now will become two separate nations the nation splits the seed of this i explained to you last week was when the leaders of judah after the death of absalom went to get the king king david out of exile and bring him back in the legal process of doing that, they, they left the tribe of Israel completely out, the ten tribes. Their excuse was, well, he's from our tribe, he's our kin. But 
that little seed, which would seem such an in, insignificant thing that you think they might have had job, but that was the beginning of the end. It took about 50 years. Sometimes we make decisions that cast a long shadow. Amen. And uh, so here uh, Sheba saw the opportunity uh, of the discontent of the northern ten tribes and he led a rebellion. <laughs> and uh, the northern ten tribes at this point refused to acknowledge the returning David. And so the split, technically, it doesn't happen for 50 years, but the split of these countries dividing into two separate nations begins right here. Now, David, because we determined out of Psalms, what, 41 and 55, David was sick, and so when Absalom pulled his stunt to disrupt the country, David was too sick and too whatever to deal with it. Well, David learned his lesson. And so the minute Sheba pulled his stunt, David was on top of it. And so now we go to David's three generals, and I'll just tell the story from here on out. The three generals were Emasa, Abishai, and Joab. Uh, Joab had been David's general from the very beginning, but Joab had turned out against David. And Joab had become a political opportunist. And Joab had had some very sharp contentions with David. And so when David got back on his throne, he determined to replace Joab as the head of the army with uh, Amasa. And so there's another general in there, Abishai. Uh, so the three generals, David tells um, Abishai, I think I'm getting this right, to gather the army together to go against Sheba. He gave him a deadline. Abishai missed the deadline. So he tells Amasa to hurry up and get the southern tribe together and meet at Mount Gilboa to go find Sheba and take care of the rebellion. In the meanwhile, Joab, who is chafing under being replaced by Amasa, gathers his loyalists and these three generals with their three separate armies all meet at Mount Gilboa. Amasa takes the initiative because David had told him to, to unite these three groups of soldiers to go to find Sheba and kill him and his followers. When they all meet, Joab, who is a master deceiving politician, uh, goes to up to Amasa and kisses him. But of course his intent was to kill him. And he takes him from the right side to kiss him and he gets out his dagger on the left hand and kills him on the spot in front of everybody. So that takes care of one general. Joab and Abishai then muster the rest of the forces, go to another city where they find uh, Sheba and begin to the process, they fortify the city enough to build mounds around it so they can get in but nobody can get out. That was the purpose of mounds in, in olden warfare. And, uh, and uh, a woman, an old woman, uh, calls over the over the the wall to Joab and says, Are you really gonna destroy this whole city? 
for one man? <clears throat> and, and Joab said, no, if you'll deliver Sheba. And she said, uh, you'll have him today. And so she goes back in time, has the men find Sheba. They cut his head off and throw it over the wall. And Joab says, okay, and they all left. The subject is a very distasteful one. The governmental dealings of God with individuals and nations. Romans 11, 36. For of him and through him too are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Daniel said twice in his book, we did the book of Daniel last year, God ruleth in the kingdom of men. Now, what was the deal? We, we understand what the deal was with Sheba. He had been found and killed. But what was, the, what was the idea? What's going on? If God rules, what's the deal about the murder of Amasa? Well, Amasa was David's brother's boy. When you study out the history of Amasa, he was a very evil, violent man who had committed a number of senseless murders. Plus, you got to remember, what did God say to David when David did what he did? He said, the sword shall never depart from your house. Now, that just didn't mean David's one home and kid. That the house meant the whole Davidic dynasty. So the truth of the matter is, this was not, Amasa was not an innocent man being murdered. This was a man that died because he was, according to the, uh, the law, the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic Law, he was worthy of death. Now, I'm going to jump ahead just long enough to say David does not do anything with Joab at this point who did the killing. First of all, David was afraid of Joab because it was David who said to Joab, when you get back in the battle, have Uriah killed. Remember that? So, Joab had, had something over David. And so, David, the rest of his life, feared Joab. And Joab knew it and took full advantage of it. But Joab didn't get away with anything. Because on his deathbed, God, I mean, David ordered his son Solomon, who was going to take the throne, when he had the opportunity to execute Joab. And Joab was executed, but not by David, but by David's son. This is a lot of killing and warring and bloodshed. And let me read the statement again. This deal, the government, the governmental dealings of God with individuals and nations. First of all, we have to understand that we don't understand it all. Here's what we need to understand. Well, number one, God does rule completely. And number two, God doesn't make any mistakes. So, there you go. God does rule in the kingdoms of men. Amasa died. Uh, Sheba died. They were violent men. Israel, the nation, eventually uh, was judged and put into Assyrian captivity. Judah eventually was, was judged uh, and, uh, and in 581 was put into Babylonian captivity. And I hate to tell you, but uh, God will eventually judge America if we keep going right along. God will eventually judge America. There's a verse, uh, I was going to use it later, but I'll, I'll use it now and later. Uh, Numbers 35, 33. Blood, it defies.
defileth the land. And the land cannot be cleansed but by the blood of them who shed blood. That's a moral principle in the government of God. Now, unless you've got a question, that's all I'm going to say about chapter 20. Because like I said, it did not directly was about David's life, only indirectly. It was about his three generals. Uh, we here in Stephenville, Texas, don't have a clue about the power struggles in government at any level. Only those who have ever been in government have some idea of the power struggles that go on in government. Because government was supposed to run things for human government, no a government, covenant. Human government was supposed to run things for God. Instead, human government, the people run things for their own profit. And Satan is the ruler of this world. And so it goes like it goes. But the point out of chapter 20, God is not a silent spectator 20 eons away. God is aware and God knows what's going on. All right, then. Any questions on chapter 20? <sighs> okay, let, all of a sudden everybody's going like this. <laughs> Stop that. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, only Walter goes. <laughs> All right, let's go to chapter number 21. Again, uh, God ruleth in the kingdoms of men, and again, uh, God's governmental dealings uh, of the government on earth. Now, uh, to do this, I do need to read the first 14 verses, so let's do that. Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered, It's for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement that ye may bless me, bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver, nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither for us shall I kill any man in Israel. And he said, What ye shall say, that will I do for you. And they answered, The king, the man that consumed us, and that devised against us, Saul that is, that we should be destroyed from the remaining in any of the coast of Israel, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose. And the king said, I'll give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth. Now there are going to be two Mephibosheths in this story. This is the Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, whom David promised to Jonathan. To Jonathan, there was a covenant relationship. And Mephibosheth is the one now that eats at the king's table. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. But the king took the two sons of Rizba, the daughter of Ai, whom she bare to Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, another Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michael. And these were uh, children that Michael, remember, was cursed childish because of how she treated David uh, before their marriage ended. And so these are children she brought up for another family member. And the five sons of, Mac, of Michael, that the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for her, Abiel, the son of Bezalai, the Mahathalite, and delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord, and there fell seven together, and were put to death in the days of harvest. In the first day, in the beginning of barley harvest, and Rizbah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock from before the harvest until water dropped out of them, out of heaven, upon them out of heaven, and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beast of the field by night. I have a sermon. I think uh, Chris Lewis would be the only one who would remember this that I preached one time in, uh, down there um, at. Uh, 
at the Dublin at the church uh, when I was there a good number of years ago. And I titled it's a, it's a sermon about uh, Rizba. It's called A Mother's Love. And I did that on Mother's Day. And it was told David what Rizba, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Gibeah, Gibeah, which had stolen them from the street of Bethshan, where the Philistines had hanged them when the Philistines slain Saul in Gilboa. And he brought up from thence the bones of Saul, the bones of Jonathan his son, and they gathered the bones of them that were hanged, and the bones of Saul and Jonathan his son buried they in the country of Benjamin in Zela, in the sepulchre of Kish, Saul's father. And they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God was entreated for the land. Now the story is uh, uh, pretty much as I read it. Uh, I made eight uh, simple and plain observations about the story. First of all, God sent a drop, a three-year drop, because there was innocent blood shed, blood shed of people that were promised life. Uh, and Saul broke that covenant that Israel had with the Gibeonites and killed a big bunch of them. So God sent a drop because there was sin in the nation that had not been dealt with. Uh, so a three-year drop. Um, I'm not sure. Are we really seeing more violent storms in America or is it just that we have the weather channel now. I, I really don't know. Anybody have a thought on that? No, we have a thought. Just seems like there is more and they're worse and uh, well, that, that's just reading. I'm hesitant to say they're worse. I, I personally think they're worse, but you know, now every morning you get the world in your living room. So I don't know. We're a lot more populated now. Yeah. More people, more buildings, you know, so they do more damage. Yes. So God sent bad weather, a, a big drought, three years of, of solid drought would devastate a country that is totally dependent on farming. But it's something that deserves our attention. So, number one, David perceived in his spirit that was the hand of God in the drought. That should teach us, even in outward circumstances, we need to stop and say, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? David perceived. And then, once David perceived that this was of God, number two, David sought the Lord. <clears throat> For believer, it's almost standard and conventional business uh, and protocol that when something happened in our life, in our lives, we need to stop and say, Lord, is this from you? What are you saying? David sought the Lord. Number three, when that happened, God, God answered. God answered. And by the way, when, a, when anybody, a Christian, sincerely goes to God and needs to know something, God will answer. He'll answer in his time, in his way, but God will answer. God answered. Now, number four, the law was fulfilled. The broken law. Um, there were three principles. Those come out again Sunday when I do the uh, book of First and Second Kings. Um, the three principles at work in the lives of any nation. Number one, God will bless on a national level, a nation that obeys his moral laws. Number two, God will graciously for a long time send warnings to a disobeying nation. And number three, finally, if that nation does not turn, God will eventually judge that nation. Those are three principles of God's moral law. To, by the way, individually, and collectively as a nation. So by this incident, uh, God, uh, the, the law is fulfilled. I want you to notice number five, the bloodthirsty Gibeonites. 
they said, we don't want any money, we want blood. That was not necessary. There was ample provision made in the law for atonement without the shedding of man's blood. It was the blood of the Lamb, figurative of Christ, provision made for that that could have been done. But the bloodthirsty Gibeonites, I, I, was it Sunday or last, I don't remember, when I made the statement, I think it may have been in Sunday or Sunday, watch out for people who are legalistic to the hill, they're bending about mercy, they, they want the law fulfilled to the letter. Be careful with people like that. The Gibeonites were bloodthirsty. Number six, I want you to notice Mephibosheth, the grandson of Saul was spared because, because uh, David and Jonathan, his, uh, my favorite's dad, had a covenant. There is a picture of salvation. God the Father and God the Son made a covenant. And the Son came and shed his blood under that covenant. And those of us that were run under the blood are saved. There's a real picture of salvation. Now I want you to notice number seven, the obedience of David. Now, I don't believe for a minute this is something that David really looked forward to doing. But David was willing to obey God. David had enough confidence in God. David had enough confidence in the sovereignty of God. David understood that he had someone above him that was calling the shots God, and David was obedient. And I want you to know God is appeased. Again, We in modern society, where we don't do this kind of stuff, we look at this, we're kind of shocked. But I, I need to remind you that God does deal in justice in the affairs of human government. And admittedly, most of the time, we don't understand what's going on. But you've got to trust God. And then God has a biblical principle, number 35, 33, that when blood is shed, eventually, unless there, even in our own nation, unless there is a turning back to God in the Bible, there will come a time when God will call for an accounting through judgment of the blood that is shed. Now the application to us is simply this, Romans 5.1. We are at peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we, when, when God sees the blood, we're covered. And judgment is the word. Okay? Now, um, there, uh, let me just give you a quick two or three <clears throat> word <clears throat> uh, about all the personalities in these two chapters. Mephibosheth, verse 7, he's spared because of a covenant. <clears throat> like we're spared because of a covenant between God the Father and God the Son. Rizba, uh, the loving mother, a mother's love. Us guys do not understand. Only a woman understands. To us, this is just a story. Uh, but uh, women will grieve until the day they die or over an erring child. It's just what women do. Rizba. By the way, the time from beginning of harvest to the end of harvest was 30 to 60 days, depending on the weather. Get watch over his body. Then Michael, in verse 8, the divorced first wife of uh, David, and God said she's going to be childless. But God in mercy did let her raise five boys from another family member. But, and we don't know that she's still alive at this point, but if she is, uh, she saw those boys die. And then we see an aging David now. Let's see, it's, I think it's chapter 21. Yeah, uh, verse number 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with them and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. This is, he's now getting into his 
see your ears. And we are all in this, let's see, except for the two people on the back row, except for the two men on the back row, the rest of us, we all are getting quite familiar with, as time rolls on, we just can't do what we once used to be able to do. And if we do, then it takes us, instead of one night's sleep, it takes us two nights sleep or longer to get over it. Remember, we live in a temporary house. Someday there will be a permanent one. Uh, finally, let me only say this. We see in these two chapters, not only do we see the judgment of God on evil people and evil nations, but we see the loving care of God of his own. Mephibosheth, a good man, is spared. Abishai, a good king, a good general, is spared. Rizba, <coughs> a good mother, is spared. And we see an aging David protected by his own men. What a wonderful testimony to Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters to restore my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest mine head with all my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness 